हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू दी आई आई टी पाल फॉर बायोलॉजी आई एम रिकीशा भौमिक पी जी टी बायोलॉजी एट केंद्रीय विद्यालय सेक्टर टू आर के पुरम न्यू डेली इन टूडे सेशन वी विल टेक अप पार्ट टू ऑफ द चैप्टर इन्वायरमेंटल इशूज फॉर क्लास ट्वेल्थ इन आर लास्ट सेशन वी डिड द पार्ट वन एंड बिफोर प्रोसीडिंग फर्दर लेट एस हैव अ क्विक रिकैप ऑफ वॉट वी डिड इन द लास्ट सेशन इन द लास्ट सेशन we learnt about pollution basically two types of pollution air pollution and water pollution we know that pollution is any kind of undesirable change in the composition of a resource be it air be it water land or any other resource and this undesirable change is brought about by pollutants so we saw one by one about the two type of pollution in our last session in the case of air pollution we saw that there are two major sources or reasons behind air pollution in our country one is industries and the others is automobile industrial air pollution we saw what is the effect of the air pollution on our health it can have a very damaging effect on our respiratory system it can cause various cause various type of disorders like asthma emphysema etc and in order to control we should reduce the harmful gas emissions from the industries as well as the automobiles in the case of industries we learnt about electrostatic precipitator and scrubbers which can rid relatively reduce the emission of harmful gases into the atmosphere which is coming out from these industries in the case of vehicular pollution we know that it is the major reason behind air pollution in metro cities we have studied about the effect of spm in air spm are the suspended particulate matter these are very small in size and can be inhaled directly and when inhaled it can enter into our lungs into the respiratory tract and cause inflammation it can also damage our respiratory system again leading to various type of disorders we did the case study of delhi in which we saw that because of the increasing air pollution in about 2002 a pil was launched a pil was filed in the supreme court of india taking cognizance of the fact of increasing air pollution in delhi the directive was given a strict directive was given to the government of uh, or to the state government in order to bring reform in the way we are living in in to in order to change the pollution in in order to change the situation of pollution in the city especially delhi so the entire public fleet was converted from diesel running engines to cng now why cng what are the advantages of cng cng is compressed natural gas it is a relatively efficient and cleaner fuel as compared to diesel and petrol it burns almost completely leaving very less residue moreover it cannot be siphoned off by thieves and it cannot be adulterated by like any other fuel so these were the advantages of cng and yes we did see transformation in delhi after uh, these kind of measures were taken more and more plants were planted and there was a phasing out of the old vehicles more and more cng operated vehicles were run on the road of delhi all these changes accumulated and cumulated in reforming the air pollution and there was a significant decrease in the level of air pollution in delhi but with time as the pollution is growing and the growing human population is the major concern for us the demand on the resources is increasing as a result again it has been observed that there is a shoot in the air pollution in delhi and it was uh, latest seen in mid november after the dipavali and there was a there was a hazy smoke in the morning and evening time because of which the government declared 3 days off for schools it was so dangerous to go outside the outside our homes in that type of situation so again we need to 
we need to analyze the situation and we need to take concrete measures in order to make our environment safer for our children, for all the people living in the cities. Auto fuel policy, we saw that the Euro 2 norms and Bharat stage 2 norms were operational in our country. But we have advanced and now we are following the advanced version of these fuel policy like Bharat stage 4 and Euro 5. Then we moved on to the water pollution. That water pollution is again a very, uh, is again a cause of concern to all of us because water is our lifeline and we cannot do without water. So, what are the causes? Water pollution, the causes are the domestic sewage, the industrial effluents, agrochemicals which get drained into the water bodies. Then there is alien species invasion, for example, the aquatic weed, water hyacinth. These all lead to many phenomenon which is seen in the water bodies or which disturbs the ecological system of aquatic bodies. We saw the, we learned about the concept of dissolved oxygen content and biochemical oxygen demand and how they are inversely proportional to each other. If the nutrient content is more, it results in excessive growth of algae which is known as algal bloom. There is excessive growth of phytoplanktons. They will get decayed and in order to decompose them, oxygen will be required by the microorganism and if the dissolved oxygen content is less in the water bodies, then it will require more oxygen resulting into high BOD, high biochemical oxygen demand. And this gradually and eventually leads to cultural eutrophication. We also learnt about the phenomenon known as biomagnification, where for instance, if a toxic pollutant like DDT or mercury enters into the food chain of the water body, it cannot be metabolized or excreted out of the body of that particular organism. It accumulates there. Not only does it accumulate, but it also gets increased many a times and is passed on to the next trophic level. And this successive increase of the toxicant in the food chain at various, at the successive trophic level is known as biomagnification. And the impact of biomagnification is more severe in those organisms which are at the higher trophic levels. For instance, we learned, we studied about the case of birds, the water birds which feed on the fishes and the concentration of DDT has been found to be much more in their bodies leading to disturbing their calcium metabolism because of which their eggs, they, the eggs which are laid, they break prematurely and this is leading to the decline in bird population, again impacting the ecosystem severely. So, these were the concepts which we studied in our last session. Along with the aspects of pollution and the phenomenon and processes related to the concept of pollution, we also learnt about the strategies which were taken to combat these problem. For instance, in the case of air pollution, we saw that in Delhi, um, uh, severe measures, strict measures were taken in order to reduce air pollution. Similarly, in case of water pollution, we saw the example of the people of Arcata, which is a town in California, where an integrated wastewater treatment plant was developed with the help of the local people along with the biologist from the Humboldt State University and they came out with a plan which was novel as well as sustainable. This plan helped in removing the pollutants from the water bodies. It included two stages, the primary and the secondary. The primary was the conventional one which involved sedimentation, filtration and bleaching. And the secondary sta stage treatment was that was a novel one where a network of marshes were created and the water was allowed to seep through it so that it gets filtered naturally and the toxic elements is absorbed. This is how the uh, integrated wastewater treatment plant was a huge success. It not only helped in solving the problem of water pollution, but it also increased the biodiversity of that area. 
So, with these concepts in our mind, let us now focus on to the focus on to uh, more topics which we will be learning in this session. But before proceeding, let us first have again a picture of air pollution. This picture I showed it in, in the last session in order to develop a perspective so that you get a complete picture of the air which we are inhaling and how dangerous it can be for our health and for other species which are living on this earth. So, in this picture you can see the sources of air pollution, automobiles, thermal power plants, industries and our domestic houses, the, uh, agriculture which uh, engages in stub burning, the practice of stub burning is prevalent in many of these states of India and all these are the sources of air pollution. These emit pollutants into the atmosphere like nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, more of carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds which have very low boiling point and they vaporize quickly into the air. And these are emitted usually, uh, uh, usually by many of the items which are present at our home. For example, the paints, the old furnitures, they releases VOCs. Then uh, again with, uh, in the stub burning also the pollutants are released. And we know that in the environment other factor, other abiotic factor is also present. For example, moisture in the air, vapor, uh, sun, the heat and the UV rays are there which can lead to new reactions. So, these are the primary pollutants and these primary pollutant. Uh, recall that the primary pollutants are the one which has an identifiable source. These sources are identifiable, almost all of these they uh, depend on the burning of fossil fuels and release these gases. These gases are harmful because they are like pollutants into the air. Now what happens that the already present factor in the environment like the presence of UV rays, heat and vapor, they can initiate a reaction with these primary pollutants. Here we can see that the UV rays along with the nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, they are forming different types of substances. Smog which we mistake to be a fog is the hazy, uh, the hazy fog like condition which is seen in winter, uh, particularly in cities is not fog but it is a dangerous pollutant which is known as smog. Smog comprises of pan which is peroxyacetyl nitrate. It is a pollutant, secondary pollutant which may cause inflammation on uh, inflammation to our eyes. Then there is a bad ozone, the ozone which is being formed in the troposphere is the bad ozone because this is poisonous and this bad ozone is also resulting from the reaction of primary pollutants. Then if the pollutants they combine with the water present in the atmosphere then they form acid, respective acid and this results into acid rains which can again kill aquatic organism, they can be lethal to the plants and they also are damaging our beautiful monuments like Taj Mahal uh, whose marble is getting deteriorated and its color is changing from white to yellow because of acid rain. So, this gives you a complete picture of what is air pollution what are its sources, what is primary pollutant, what is secondary pollutants and how they can impact us. Similarly, for water pollution also we can develop a perspective in our mind. For example, if this is the water body and these are the sources of pollutants, the domestic sewage is drained into the water body, from the agriculture, agrochemicals are being drained or washed off into the water bodies. Then there is thermal power plant, thermal water without any treatment is getting drained and again the industrial waste. Here I would like to make it clear that it is mandatory for all the industries to discharge its waste water before prior treatment in the waste water treatment plant. But unfortunately, we know that many of the industries do not follow this suit or the rule and that is why we are facing so many problems related to water pollution. 
So, these are the major sources of water pollution which is polluting this water body. Now, uh, I have also shown the aquatic organism in this water body, the planktons, phytoplankton, zooplankton, small fishes, big fish, bird. And this is the food chain, this is the ecosystem of this pond or the water body. Uh, when the nutrient or the chemicals they are discharged into the water bodies, they will result into excessive growth of algae and phytoplankton. This excessive growth will form a layer over the surface of water body and this is known as algal bloom. This will not allow sunlight to enter into the pond ecosystem. And also the nutrients which are getting accumulated may also contain certain toxic elements or compounds for instance DDT or mercury. And when this DDT it enters into the food chain, we know that it will be magnified up to more than 10 times in the next trophic level and its impact can be seen in the birds which lay eggs which, which break prematurely and this leads to decline in the, in the bird population. And eventually what will happen? This lake is undergoing the process of eutrophication. But because of these interference, this natural process of eutrophication will get accelerated and lead to cultural eutrophication. Ultimately, the lake will choke to death because of all these sources of water pollution. So, it is a matter of grave concern to all of us if our water resources, if the air we are breathing, if the land on which we live gets polluted. How can we think that we can sustain, we can live without these lifelines, without these resources which are so, which are so indispensable for us. Uh, now let us check our understanding of the concepts which we discussed in our last session. Question number 1 is, this element is added to paint mainly to speed up drying and increase durability. But due to its toxic effects, it has been banned in many countries. Most homes built before the year 1960 contained this element in its paint. Which element is this? Your options are A. Mercury B. Lead C. Earth pigment D. Clay So, what do you think will be the correct answer? Yes, you are correct. The correct answer is B. Lead Lead was used in paints and it is a pollutant because when released into the environment, it makes its way into the air, soil and water. Lead can remain in the environment as dust indefinitely. The lead in fuels, they contribute to air pollution especially in urban areas. So, lead is a potent pollutant and it was used in the paints which we used in our homes. So, the, the use of lead now has been minimized after acknowledging its role as a pollutant. Let us move on to the next question. The presence of which of the following microorganism in river Ganga indicates contamination? A. Lactobacillus bacteria, B. Amoeba, C. Coliform bacteria and D. Mucor species. What will be the correct answer? We know that certain microorganisms they act like indicators, pollution indicator. If they are present more in number, then it indicates their contamination. For example, in the case of river Ganga, we have found more number of coliform bacteria. So, what should we remember here is that they are commonly used indicator of sanitary quality of food and water. If the food and is contaminated, water is contaminated, it can be known by the presence of these bacteria. They are rod shaped gram negative, non spore forming and motile or non motile bacteria. They are universally present in large number of in large numbers in the feces of warm blooded animals. So, feces can contaminate the water bodies and uh, this bacteria is found in the feces of many organisms. So, it is like a indicator. 
similarly you must remember that lichen is also a pollution indicator but the case is opposite there the lichens will stop growing as we learned in the chapter of evolution if you remember the lichens they are pollution indicator they stop growing if the if the surrounding is more polluted next question is what is carbon credit have you heard this term before what is carbon credit let us first explore the options it is the difference between the carbon emission allowed and actually emitted carbon b it is the loan amount by imf international monetary fund for reducing pollution c it is loan given to poor people for buying modern stoves d all of the above so what do you think it is like a hint for you what is carbon credit yes you are right it is a it is the difference between the carbon emission allowed and actually emitted carbon carbon credit is actually a tool which was devised uh, at the kyoto protocol for reducing carbon emission uh in in this protocol we have two types of countries in exer 1 and in exer 2 and these countries they have certain allowed carbon emission they have been sanctioned certain allowed carbon emission and if the emission is less than which is allowed then it uh, this 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 difference can be used like for trading purposes between the countries so this is the concept behind so that at the global level the carbon emission is curbed so you have to remember that carbon credit shows that country or any entity emit the carbon below the limit prescribed by the government hence country or entity can sell it in exchange where carbon credits are traded so this carbon credit has become like a monetary tool which can be traded between the countries in order to reduce the overall emission of carbon in the atmosphere next question is what are the various constituents of domestic sewage discuss the effect of sewage discharge on a river uh, if you remember we uh, learnt about this the domestic sewage and we also know that only 0.1% of impurities make the water unfit for drinking and this 0.1% impurities comprises of suspended solids like sand silt and clay colloidal materials like fecal matter bacteria cloth paper fibers dissolved materials like nutrients which may might be nitrate ammonia phosphate sodium calcium etc and this 0.1 impure percent impurities can be detrimental to the water bodies for instance if you remember this graph which we discussed in our last session that when the sewage is discharged into the water body there is a drastic decline in the dissolved oxygen content and the bod shoots up because there is a high demand of oxygen in order to decompose this sewage which has been discharged into the water body by the microorganism as the decomposition process takes place and the bod gradually decreases the dissolved oxygen content will start increasing in the water body and there will be a reappearance of clean water organism so it is like a natural mechanism of the water body to purify itself but what if the capacity uh, if what if if we are uh, discharging the pollutants more than the water body's capacity to replenish itself it will certainly die it will lead to eutrophication and the lake will turn into land in a very short period of time next question is write critical notes on the following eutrophication biological magnification ground water depletion and ways for its replenishment so when you are asked to write critical notes that doesn't mean that you can write anything you need to write you need to focus on certain value points while writing notes for instance if you are writing on eutrophication first you will tell that it is a natural process of aging of lake and it is a slow process but it is a thing of concern for us why because the industrial and agricultural pollutants they are accelerating this aging process because of the addition of nutrients various other phenomenons you can relate with it like algal bloom in order to 
decompose the dead remains of these algae and plants which are in abundance. The microorganism requires more oxygen, so there will be decline in dissolved oxygen content and the biochemical oxygen demand will increase which will lead to choking of the lake. So, all these value points should be there in your answer whenever you are writing on the topic eutrophication. Similarly, when you are telling about biological magnification, the terminology itself signifies that it is taking place in biological bodies and there is a process of magnification which is going on. So, you need to describe it in precise terms that it is a phenomenon in which a toxic pollutant it gets accumulated in tissues in increasing concentration along the food chain. And why is it increasing? Because this pollutant, it is an artificial pollutant, it is not a natural pollutant and it can neither be metabolized by the in, inside the body of the organism and neither can it be excreted out. So, it is getting accumulated and being passed and with every trophic level there is an increase in the biomass. So, there is an increase in the concentration of these pollutants to the next level. This phenomenon is very well known for DDT and mercury and with this you need to give an example also to show this phenomena to show the concentration increase. For example, if you say that in water the DDT content is 0.003 parts per million in the body of zooplankton it will increase to 0.04 ppm in the body of small fishes it will be 0.5 ppm in the case of large fishes it will two, be 2 ppm and at the highest trophic level which is the fish eating birds it will be 25 ppm and this concentration is enough to cause significant changes in their metabolism. Next moving on to the third part which is ground water depletion and ways for its replenishment. So, what do you mean by ground water? Obviously, the water which is present in the ground or the water which is present beneath the earth surface is known as ground water and depletion is also clear in itself that the ground water is getting depleted and we have heard many such news from all across the country of scarcity of water due to ground water depletion especially in summers. So, how can we replenish it? So, while you are writing the answer, first you need to mention what is ground water. It is the water present beneath the earth surface in soil pore spaces and in the fractures of rock formations. These rock, the rock which is completely saturated with water at the ground level, at the ground water level is known as aquifer. So, what is an aquifer? It is a rock which is completely saturated with water. It is a source of ground water. Water table or water level is the upper level of the underground surface from which if we dig deep into the ground the level at which we will start finding water is the water table or the water level. So, it is the upper level of the underground surface in which the soil or rocks are permanently saturated with water. Ground water is becoming scarce in many parts of the world due to Again, what might be the reason? Yes, whatever environmental issues we are learning, we know that human activities has is the most important contributor in all the deteriorating uh, factors of the environment. So, we are excessively pumping out water from the ground before it can be replenished naturally. Again, the water, the ground water also has a tendency to replenish itself by the cycles which is present in the nature, hydrological cycle, water cycle and all the presence of trees, transpiration, they are all contributing in the maintenance or regulation of the water cycle in nature. But before that recharging or replenishing can be done, we are more and more pumping out, out the water out of it. Again, because of the growing human population, our needs are immense and even the environment has limited resources to fulfill all our needs. The second is deforestation. On one hand, we are pumping out more water and on the other hand, the 
factors which can regulate the replenishing of water into the nature is being destroyed by us in the form of deforestation. The trees which can help in maintaining the water cycle they are becoming lesser and lesser in number. So, what should we do? Obviously, these two factor needs to be curtailed, needs to be curbed. Number one, excessive pumping should be avoided and number two, more and more forest should be grown, reforestation should be done and also nowadays we can do rainwater harvesting in order to recharge the groundwater level. So, these are the methods by which we can replenish our groundwater. So, we have discussed enough about the concepts which we learned in our last session. Now, in today's les lesson, we will explore more concepts relating to environmental issues. So, we will learn about noise pollution, its effect and control on us, its effect on us and how to control it. We will learn about solid waste and its management. We will also learn about the types of solid waste hospital waste, electronic waste or e-waste, plastic waste and its management, agrochemicals and their effects, organic farming, radioactive waste management and certainly we will also see some examples of new solutions taken up by people across the world in order to deal with these environmental problems. Let us begin with noise pollution. So, what is noise? Any unpleasant loud sound is known as noise. India has always been a pioneer in the field of taking or making out policies with respect to the environmental issues. The AIR Act as I told you in the earlier session, it was enacted in 1981, the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, but it was amended later in 1987 to include noise as an air pollutant. So, noise is also under the category of air pollutant. Noise is undesirable, unpleasant, high level of sound. Sound above 90 decibels can be harmful. Noise may cause psychological and physiological disorders in humans. Noise is a pollutant and it can cause psychological and physiological disorder. Uh, although it is not as, as obvious pollutant as the other we have seen in the case of air pollution and water pollution, but it may cause mental stress to us, it can, uh, it can impact our physio physiology, it can impact our psychology and it can create psychological disorders. A brief exposure for instance to extremely high sound level more than 150 decibel may permanently impair our hearing ability. Noise also causes sleeplessness, anxiety, increased heartbeat, palpitation, altered breathing pattern and stress and especially so in the case of small children, in the case of elderly people and those who are undergoing any treatment, this can adversely affect their health. So, what can we do to control noise pollution? Number one, we can use sound absorbent materials like foam or cloth uh, or we can muffle the noise in order to reduce the noise pollution. So, by using these sound absorbent materials, we can construct sound proof buildings. We can use silencers in automobile engines and machines. Uh, moreover, it has become mandatory for the industries to use silencers as well as for the automobiles to use silencers in their engine. But if the situation is so uh, high that the noise pollution cannot be or the silencers cannot be are not enough for curbing the uh, loud noise, then the industry such industry should be set up at a far away location which is away from the settlements. We should be sensitive to others problem, being sensitive, being sensible actually solves many of our problems and it also helps uh, in, in comfortable living of others. For example, keeping the volume of your devices low or using earphones to enjoy music. Stringent following of laws laid down in relation to noise. 
there has been we know that laws and rules and regulations are full in place but their implementation their following depends on us if we start following them strictly then we can curb this menace of noise pollution delimitation of horn free zone around hospitals and schools permissible sound level of crackers and of loud speakers are there which we should follow timings after which loud speakers dj's cannot be played we should follow these timings so these are the methods by which we can control the noise pollution now next moving on to solid waste so what do you mean by solid waste solid waste means everything all the garbage which is getting accumulated at our homes you can imagine the amount of garbage which we generate in one single day and if you uh, extrapolate this to the 10 houses present in your locality then going far be, uh, more uh, going above more we will see that in the entire city all the villages and all over india how many sol how much solid waste do we generate it is actually a matter of concern if we are not able to dispose it properly so let us try to define solid waste first it means any garbage refuse sludge from a waste water treatment plant and other discarded materials including solid liquid semi solid or even contained gaseous materials resulting from industrial commercial mining and agricultural operations etc so in short we can say that everything that goes out in trash is the solid waste municipal solid waste it comprises of the waste from homes offices stores schools hospitals etc municipal solid waste they comprise of by going from the source we can uh, we can understand what what uh, the solid waste will comprise of it will comprise of paper food waste plastics glass metals rubbers leathers textile etc so we know that all this comprise of solid waste and if it's getting accumulated everywhere it can lead to further environmental problems so trash is a menace actually it is a menace as you can see here in this cutting a newspaper cutting uh, 1.43 lakh million ton of solid waste is produced in urban india daily out of which only 23% that is 32871 million ton is processed and out of this processed waste 24 megawatt power can be generated from this municipal waste india's actual potential to generate power from the waste is 500 megawatt and it is expected that it can increase up to 750 megawatt by 2019 as per the source of central pollution control board annual report 2014-15 so we uh, can see we can look at these data and know that about uh, about only 23% is processed what about the rest what happens to the rest of the waste it is just getting accumulated in the environment and it is causing pollution and we know that this solid waste this garbage is actually the breeding ground of many disease causing organisms many vectors like mosquitoes flies they uh, they get a suitable breeding ground on these solid waste so it can lead to many kind of diseases epidemics flus influenzas so again Uh, this is a matter of concern for us that only 23% of the municipal waste which include household and commercial garbage construction debris produced in a day is processed or properly disposed of india generates 24 megawatt of power from such waste at four waste to energy plants so we are we can convert this waste into a resource we can convert uh, the waste into energy but again we have certain limitation because of which we are not able to utilize the full potential of this waste which can get converted into a resource or energy waste to energy is currently economically unviable due to high generation cost but seeing the impact taking cognizance of the impact of this waste 
which if not utilized if not disposed of can create such a menace in the environment we should think of certain solutions to curb, to curb this menace and to uh, overcome the economical unviability related to these projects again in this newspaper cutting you can see that as the population of the state for instance in the case of delhi is increasing the per capita waste generation is also seeing a similar increase and the total waste generation in tons per day is also getting increased so it needs to be we need to find some solution to our solid waste and what are the traditional uh, pro, uh, solutions which are being done traditional measures which are being taken to reduce this solid waste is number 1 burning it reduces the volume of the waste but it does not burn to completion moreover it creates again air pollution one kind of pollution is again leading to another kind of pollution so this is not a feasible or long term solution for our problem then open dumps if 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 they are dumped in open they can serve as breeding ground for rats and flies as i told you earlier and it can spread epidemics and many diseases sanitary landfills are the places where the uh, where the garbage is dumped into the soil and then it is covered with the soil so that it gets decomposed naturally so these are being adopted as the substitute for open burning dumps there are three landfill sites namely bhalaswa landfill site gazipur uh, sanitary landfill site okla sanitary landfill site in delhi but are these landfill sites adequate enough for the large amount of garbage which we are generating daily at our houses even in industries and other sources uh, in sanitary landfill wastes are dumped in a trench or depression after compaction and covered with dirt every day so actually in initially also it is a low lying area which is suitable for uh, converting it into a landfill site all the waste is dumped in the trench or depression the trench is made in this low lying area so that the waste can be dumped off and it is left for natural decomposition the dirt is being covered every day but now the situation is that these landfill sites are also being completely filled and no more if we are adding more waste we are just accumulating on it it is not going the natural process of decomposition the amount of garbage generated has increased so much so that these sites are getting filled and because of this overload on these sanitary landfills now there is a danger of the seepage of chemicals from these landfills which can pollute the underground water resources so again the one one problem is leading to another problem the we are unable to manage our solid waste the chemicals which are present in it it, it can leach into the soil and it can affect the ground water resource again causing pollution and this water can this pollutant can again come back to us in the form of biomagnification so there are so many processes which are undergoing in the nature and uh, the ecosystem is gradually declining the ecosystem balance is uh, shaking and we need to do something in order to stop this imbalance of the ecosystem here you can see the picture of a landfill site uh, which has uh, which has piled up and it gives you an appearance of a hill but it is not actually a hill but it is a landfill site and its use should have been stopped 3 years ago but it is being continued even now so these are the problems we need to uh, identify more such land uh, sanit sanitary landfill sites and we need to regularly regularly monitor these landfill sites if we are using them for this purpose so what is the solution to our solid waste can you think of any feasible solution to deal with this solid waste to deal with this enormous solid waste which we are generating through our activities the only solution can be if we become more sensitive to environmental issues all waste that we generate can be categorized into three types biodegradable non biodegradable and recyclable 
Biodegradable are those waste which can be easily degraded because they are natural substances and the decomposer the microorganisms can act on them and it can decompose them uh, through the natural process. Non-biodegradable are actually those substances which has been artificially synthesized and the decomposers they cannot decompose them because and so they will live in the environment for a long period and act as a pollutant. Then there are the recyclable ones which can be recycled, remolded or reused into other forms, into other articles. So, if we are aware and we know that the composition of our waste, we can segregate. Suppose each individual starts segregating the waste at the source, our biodegradable waste, our non-biodegradable waste and the recyclables, then the task of municipal corporation and the government can be reduced to a large extent. So, all garbage generated should be sorted out. Segregation of waste at source can help in effective management of solid waste. So, what can we do with our waste? Biodegradable waste, we can compost it. Non-biodegradable waste, we will send to the MCD for its proper disposal. The recyclable waste, either we can reuse or we can uh, we can sell it to our kabadiwalas, rag pickers, which uh, and these people, they uh, take these items to the concerned industries where it can be recycled. So, we need to judiciously use our resources and we need to judiciously segregate our waste. So, in order to do its effective management so that it does not become a trouble for us. In this clipping you can see that uh, under a zero waste policy home can be given up to 5 bins. One for the landfill, the non-biodegradable one, uh, the paper waste, the recyclables, food, compost and like this if uh, the if the waste is being segregated at the source it can effectively help in management of our solid waste so how can we effectively reduce our garbage what can be reused or recycled should be separated out biodegradable waste can be put into deep pits in the ground or in the garden and be left for natural breakdown as they can be easily degraded by the microbes Non-biodegradable waste which cannot be decomposed easily by the microorganism remains in the environment for long. To reduce the garbage should be our prime goals. Instead, we are increasing the use of non-biodegradable product. So, the, uh, so, what should we do for non-biodegradable product? We need to reduce their consumption. Especially for example, plastic has become such a menace for us. We find everything packaged in plastic, right from the plastic carry bags which we are carrying, very simple commodities which we use in our daily lives, all of them are getting packaged in the plastic bags. These plastic bags are very harmful for the environment because they cannot be degraded. In order to reduce their consumption, we should take initiatives on our individual level by using more and more of biodegradable materials like cloth, jute, carry bags and use of eco-friendly packaging should be encouraged by the state government. Although the state government is pushing for reduction in the use of plastic and use of eco-friendly packaging, but because of the public popularity, it has not become possible. But if we are not concerned about our environment, if we are not concerned about the impact which these changes, which these pollutants or substances can bring on us, then uh, no state government policies can do anything. So, we need to become aware, a concerned citizen for the environment. We can do our bit by carrying clothes, jute, carry bags. Next is hospital waste. The waste which is generated in hospital is known as hospital waste and we know that in hospitals we deal with many kind of items and bandages for instance the cotton, the used cotton and many other things. These contain disinfectants, it can contain pathogens and it can also contain harmful chemicals. So, these need to be carefully treated and disposed of before it can infect others. The use of incinerator, in incinerator at a very high temperature, the waste is completely burnt so that no ash is 
left off. So the use of incinerators is crucial to disposal of the hospital waste. You must have seen this symbol over certain vans. This symbol is actually the symbol of biohazard symbol that it, it the van is carrying some hospital waste which needs to be uh, decomposed or disposed of quickly and completely. Next is electronic waste. With modern developments, with our changing lifestyles, we are using more and more of such substances which has added up to the already present pollution in the environment. Like other waste, this waste has also become a prime concern for us and this is the electronic waste. We are using electronic gadgets, we are using computers, mobiles, laptops and when they become irreparable, they form, they constitute what is known as electronic waste. At each home, especially in the urban setups, you can find so many electronic junk devices. So what should we do with them? They are buried in landfills or incinerated. But metals like copper, iron, silicon, nickel and gold, which are the precious metals which are present in these electronic devices, they should be recovered during the recycling process. In developing countries, this might involve manual participation, thus exposing workers to toxic substances. So what the developed countries also follow is that they send their electronic junk to the developing countries and here the disposal of the electronic waste or taking out of these metals from the junk is done by the workers manually and this is exposing them to the toxic substances and it can create disorders or diseases in them. So this is also one of the problem because of the lifestyle changes we are facing. Recycling is the only solution for the treatment of e-waste as of now. Uh, again in this cutting you can see in this newspaper clipping you see that e-waste is a grim look at a growing issue. 41.8 million tons of e-waste in 2014 is equal to about 7 pyramids, 6 million elephants, 1772 titanics. Improperly recycled or mined e-waste is hazardous for our uh, health because it contains heavy metals like lead, mercury, silver, arsenic and we know that how they can damage our respiratory systems and our um, body functions. So again e-waste is a thing of concern to us and we need to manage it effectively. Remedy for plastic waste, a novel approach was taken by Ahmed Khan which, who was a plastic sack manufacturer in Bengaluru. He realized that plastic waste was a real problem. He devised a fine powder of recycled modified plastic called polyblend. So polyblend is a fine powder made up of recycled modified plastic. It can be mixed with bitumen which is a type of coal to lay roads. In collaboration with RV College of Engineering and the Bangalore City Corporation, Ahmed Khan proved that this mixture helped to increase the road life by a factor of 3. More than 40 km of road in Bangalore has been laid using this mixture. It has enhanced the earning of rag pickers which are paid more now because of this novel approach adopted by Ahmed Khan. Along with an efficient management of one of the notorious ways that is plastic, it has also strengthened the roads. So this is a novel approach which was taken by at an individual level by a plastic sack manufacturer. And we expect that more and more such solution come from the individuals concerned so that we can effectively solve our problems. Now coming next to the agriculture, agriculture has also contributed its bit in polluting the environment. We know about green revolution. Green revolution was a tremendous increase in the crop production in 1960s. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan along with Dr. Norman Borlaug introduced high yielding variety of seeds. Along with the high yielding varieties of seed, improved agricultural practices, use of inorganic fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, weedicides etc. were also introduced. It solved India's problem of famine and hunger at that time. It made it self-sufficient. But do you think in the long run it has made us self-reliant? 
the use of chemical fertilizers pesticides incidentally are toxic to non target organisms don't you think it will affect the balance of that ecosystem do you think this can be biomagnified in terrestrial ecosystems as we have seen in the case of aquatic ecosystem what about the impact on soil so in this session i am leaving you with these questions to reflect over the consequences of green revolution do you think that green revolution has helped us in the long term so when you so when you come up in the next session we will be discussing about the impact of green revolution and what impact it has caused on our environment what are the sustainable solutions which can be adopted to deal with these problems with this uh, let's end this session thank you